Thinking Aloud, conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with parapsychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Our topic today is the experience of physical mediumship. My guest is Stuart Alexander, author of An Extraordinary Journey, the Memoirs of a Physical Medium. Stuart has been engaged in this practice for practically a half century. In fact, it's been over half a century since he began sitting in spiritualist home circles. I think if you haven't already watched my previous interview with Stuart, The Making of a Physical Medium, you would get a lot more out of today's interview if you do that. And so I'm linking to it right now. If you click right there in the upper right portion of your screen, you'll be able to see that video. And uh, the one we're about to do today will make so much more sense if you watch that one first. Stuart is based in northeastern England, and now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Stuart. It's a great pleasure to be with you once again. Thank you, Jeff. It's a pleasure for me to uh, to be invited back. Thank you. Well, we did a previous interview. I've encouraged our viewers to uh, view it if they haven't already seen it, where you talked about the the process of over many years becoming a physical medium. And today I'd like to talk more about some of the experiences that you've had. And one, one of the most fascinating topics that comes up is uh, the, the nature of ectoplasm. People have seen almost Almost everybody has seen these photographs showing ectoplasm, and it's almost unbelievable when, when you see the photos. But uh, I'd like to hear more about what ectoplasm is like from your experience. Well, all I can say, Jeff, is first of all, the word ectoplasm was coined by a French Nobel Prize winning medical man called Charles Richer, and that was back in 1894. Now, he uh, was very involved in psychical research, particularly in regards to physical mediumship. Now, as I understand it, ectoplasm is within all living beings, all living beings, but it is, it's not unique to the physical, nor is it unique to the spiritual, but it is the only energy or substance, if you wish to call it that, which is common to both the physical and the spiritual. Now, my understanding is that a physical medium possesses a greater quantity, if you like, a greater amount of ectoplasm within them than most other people do. And all physical manifestations within the seance room rely and depend upon this substance, this energy that we refer to now as ectoplasm. And as I understand it, it is taken from the medium, from the ears, from the nose, from the mouth or from the solar plexus. And when it leaves the medium, as it is extracted by the spiritual world, then it is as I understand it, almost smoke-like, very unsubstantial, almost smoke-like, but very quickly, and I don't know how this is done, the spirit world are able to work with it to uh, transform it from that to something very substantial. Or if I say like steel, no, not steel, but something very substantial. And it is... The spirit world using the ectoplasm in various ways that create the physical manifestations within the seance room. That is my understanding. Uh, it's so interesting, Stuart, because you're describing it almost like a scholar. And I think the, the reason is because you are relatively unconscious during these seances uh, when the ectoplasm is manifesting itself. So uh, you're not aware uh, very much of the actual experience of it. That's quite correct. That's quite correct. But I think the important thing to remember is that although, yes, I am a, a medium uh, who spent half a century developing 
the gift. I don't. I prefer not to call it a gift. I don't think of it as a gift. But developing this mediumship. Also, I've right from the very beginning, going back half a century, I was passionately interested in the history of spiritualism, the mechanics of mediumship, etc., etc., etc. So, if I say to you that I've got probably about three hundred books on the subject within my collection, that's just a part of the collection. So I have educated myself, if you like, over many years uh, in respect of the position of mediums, the position of the spiritualist movement, the position of psychical research, the position of skeptics and cynics. So I've educated myself and made myself familiar with all of these things. So when I talk to you about ectoplasm, your question, what is it? you know, then I can say that, you know, I'm basing my reply not only upon personal experience and what's been told to me, but what I've discovered over a period of many years from reading, 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 and talking to people who have experienced physical mediumship. I assume that uh, you've also attended seances, so you've had the opportunity to observe ectoplasm uh, coming from other mediums. No, I've never actually uh, seen with my eyes, I've never actually seen ectoplasm. I, you know, I, I saw envy people from the past who sat with some of these wonder mediums who today we can only read about because they've long since left this earth. And the stories I've heard from them about what they witnessed, what they experienced, that they saw the ectoplasm, and, and oh, absolutely wonderful. But I've never actually personally seen it, no. Although I have sat with other physical mediums. Uh, on the other hand, I'm under the impression that many people in your own home circle have observed the ectoplasm in seances where you were in trance. That's quite correct. On occasions, the spirit world will call for the, the red light. We always have a red light available. Call for the red light to be switched on for a number of seconds. And then uh, on occasions, it's been seen, the ectoplasm has been seen to, le to be leaving me. Uh, to be extracted from me and also of course um, Walter one of the spiritual team that works with us from time to time will produce his own etheric hand um, and he does this we have a small table uh, small table and it has a glass top and underneath the glass top we have a red light uh, and he will call for the light to be switched on and then people will see the ectoplasm uh, manifesting on the table, and then from that, they will see Walter's hand gradually beginning to form. And as I understand it, it you know, from people who have sat and held his hand, it is very solid. It's a normal human hand. But it's not always Walter's hand. Uh, we have had situations where it's been children's hands, and, and people have recognized these hands. So it's very interesting. Very interesting. And I have uh, earlier uh, interviewed Leslie Kane, and, and she has witnessed this herself. So uh, on a separate interview, in fact, I'll link to it now. People can hear Leslie's testimony uh, about that. But let me ask you this, Stuart. When this is all going on, do you have any sensations of the ectoplasm uh, leaving your body? And, and anything at all like that? No, none whatsoever. None whatsoever. The only time I feel any discomfort, I have to use that word, discomfort, from time to time in recent years, the spirit world have brought me back out of trance, so I've been able to watch the manifestations taking place. Um, and sometimes the trumpet, I hope that uh, you know people that will view this in the future will know what a spiritualist trumpet is. It is for anyone who doesn't know, it's not a musical instrument. It's like a megaphone, which is about eighteen inches in height, fifteen inches in height, 
about four or five inches at the large end, tapering down to perhaps three quarters of an inch, half an inch at the small end. And the trumpet will be levitated by the spirit well and flown all around the room. Now, sometimes the, we have two trumpets and the two will move around the room together. And when that happens, if I'm awake, then I feel discomfort in the solar plexus area. But that's all. That's all. So all these things happen, and I have no real knowledge of, of these things, you know? I understand that uh, some people have wanted to be able to use infrared photography to uh, photograph the materialized hand, uh, for for example, and they, you've uh, made a decision not to allow that. And this sometimes troubles people. So uh, let, let's go into that a bit. Yes. Well, first of all, I'll, can I say that I perfectly, perfectly understand people asking the question, well, why will he not allow, you know, infrared cameras and so on, so on, so forth? Why will he not allow that within the seance room? Uh, and... <sighs> Knowing that this question would be brought up, Jeff, then I think the best way that I can answer this is to say many years ago, uh, I was very, very fortunate to uh, know a man by the name of Alan E. Crossley, who became my second mentor. And I have such wonderful, wonderful memories of my time spent with Alan Crossley. Now, he had throughout his life uh, sat with some of these wonder physical mediums of the past and to sit with Alan Crossley and to listen to his accounts of what he had experienced were absolutely wonderful. Now, I won't go into, because I think I mentioned it in the first interview, the way in which I came to know Alan Crossley, but I will just say this, that he wanted to form a circle around me uh, and he lived about two, two and a half hours away uh, by road from where we live. But once every two or three weeks, my circle leader, myself, sometimes my sister as well and other people, we would travel to his home and we would sit in this special circle that he had created around me. And it was the most wonderful, wonderful circle, I have to say. But Alan had always had this thought in his mind, this desire, this, this wish to finally capture on film by infrared a video of physical manifestations. That had been his lifetime's hope. Uh, and the circle became known as the Project Circle because that was within all of our minds that we wanted to do this, myself included. Now, the best thing I think I can do here to answer your question uh, and the question of all the sceptics and the cynics out there, the best thing I can do is to read a passage from my book, An Extraordinary Journey, uh, because here in this passage I deal with that very question. And this is what I say, um, right, um, so the circle was progressing very nicely and we were nearing the time when we thought we could introduce video cameras, infrared cameras within the seance room. And now this is what I have to say. But then my mind turned upon issues that had not previously occurred to me and those did not directly involve the spirit people because I think the spirit people were quite willing, Jeff, quite willing to go ahead with this project. For example, would such a film be taken seriously? Would it be assumed that some kind of Hollywood-type wizardry, some kind of modern-day computer photographic technology had been employed in its making? In that event, anyone entertaining hopes that it would lead to a revolution in man's understanding would be grossly mistaken. Additionally, I was forced to ask myself whether I would be prepared to enter the glaring public spotlight. The fact was that throughout my life as a developing physical medium, I had never ever sought any form of notoriety. I was, and I still am, a very private man. 
In the event that a video which captured Sion Soon physical phenomena was realised and accepted as genuine, it was not difficult to imagine that it would immediately become global news. The world's press would quickly descend since this would possibly be one of the biggest stories of all time. I therefore reasoned that my circle, which had sat for so many, many years in quiet developments, would no doubt disintegrate. Overnight, we would find ourselves under tremendous pressure from a great many directions. In all probability, lives would be destroyed and families would also be torn apart. For me, such a prospect was not only daunting, but unthinkable. That was my belief then, and it remains unchanged today. So that's what I've got to say about it, Jeff. You know, it's, you know, for people on the sidelines, for people not directly connected, it's a perfectly understandable question that they would ask. And I can imagine, and I understand fully why doubts would uh, emerge within people's minds. Why won't he allow this? But there, I hope that I've answered it within that book. It would be one of the biggest stories of all time. Can you imagine? I mean, me as a very private person, and I have been all the way along the line, and the only reason that I'm taking part in this interview and also another interview was the fact it was pointed out to me by Leslie Kane that by agreeing to be interviewed, it would help sales of the book sales of the book because to me to get the message out there the message of survival beyond death is is so important and for that reason and that reason alone i agreed to the interview but i would not agree to become you know before the world i don't want that i'm a private person you know i have a family life do you would you believe that my two sons uh who are now you know in the 40s until my original book was published in 2010, knew nothing about my mediumship. They didn't know that I was involved in this at all. And I gave them both a copy of the book, and they were absolutely shocked, rigid. They said to my wife, Dad's got a secret life. <laughs> because, because I've always led two lives, you know. I've led a family life, business life, and then to one side, the spiritual life and that's all i can really say well i i'm quite amazed that your sons weren't aware of this considering for example that your brother was involved and i think your wife was also involved yeah but the point is that we kept the two lives totally separate and that is an actual fact would you believe jeff that even today we have friends who have absolutely no idea that I am a medium, that I'm even interested in spiritualism. We have family who have no idea either. And that is the absolute truth. You know, we've always kept them. I'll tell you a little story. When White Feather first entranced me, this was the very first time I went into trance. And, I, you know, I was aware of the fact he was speaking through me, but I couldn't stop him. The following day, I was in my office, and it was lunchtime. And I was sat there enjoying a cup of coffee or something, and suddenly I felt him coming close. And I said, whoa, just, I'm sorry. I said, I can't have this. I can't have you as part of my everyday life. But the, but the agreement I made with the spirit world then is, look, when I walk into the seance room, I will give everything I possibly can give. And from that day on, they've kept their part of that bargain, and I've kept mine. I'm not a medium 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Only when I walk into the seance room am I a medium, once a week. And I understand from our conversations earlier, I think it's worth repeating that the intimate relationship of the home circle is very important for the the phenomenon that the, the people are honest, open, and trusting of each other. And, and that emotional ambiance seems to be crucial. Absolutely. Absolutely. The circle has sat now for 40 years, over 40 years. Uh, and the actual, uh, let's say the, the actual 
Oh, there are several sitters who have been there from the very beginning, and others have come along from time to time and become part of the circle. Uh, harmony is absolutely everything, and we are whatever is achieved within the circle is not because of me it's because of the circle because we are all together as a united whole and when we link with the spirit world our team links with their team and the two team become one team a united team so harmony is everything jeff yes absolutely uh, but on occasion you have done seances for that were open to the public Yes, yes indeed, yes indeed. And the only reason I've done that is because, I may have mentioned this in the first interview, forgive me if I did, but uh, I used to belong to a society called the Noah's Ark, the Noah's Ark Society for Physical Mediumship. And I was part of the committee as its archives officer, and the committee knew nothing about my mediumship whatsoever. I kept that aside. At the very first weekend residential seminar that we held, we had a young medium who was developing physical mediumship. And I happened to, to, to witness for the very first time things that had been happening, phenomena that had been happening within our circle for a long time. And after that sitting, when we were all enjoying a drink in the bar, I looked around and I could see the joy on the faces of so many, many people. Because in that hour, hour and a half that the seance was held, a belief in spirit, in, in survival beyond death had become a certainty within their minds. You know, it had converted so many people to believe 100% in survival. And I looked around and I saw this and I thought, and I suddenly felt so selfish that I was keeping this to myself because for so many years it was just the home circle and nobody else. And then that night or the following day, I spoke to the committee about the fact that I had developed physical mediumship and it all went from there. Uh, and I began to give uh, seances for the committee, uh, for the Noah's Ark Society. And then uh, we did from time to time have visitors to the home circle that would come and sit with us. And then eventually I began to hold my own weekend residential seminars just twice a year, which I held for almost 20 years. Uh, and at those residential seminars, I would hold a Saturday evening seance. Yes. So in, in this seance you attended with the Noah's Ark Society, you witnessed a lot of phenomena, uh, but I assume from our conversation just a few minutes ago that you didn't actually witness ectoplasm at the time, but you, I assume you witnessed the effects of the ectoplasm. Quite correct. Quite correct, yes. I saw, I was sitting about three seats away from the medium, uh, and there was a, a seance trumpet in front of him. And after a while, I saw the trumpet levitate into the air and then began to fly all around the room. And, of course, this had been happening with my mediumship, but I'd never seen it because I'd always been in trance. And it was the most wonderful thing for me to actually experience that, you know, to see that. Uh, and that's really, that was the opening of the door. That is when I decided I had to do something, you know, because I felt so selfish keeping it to ourselves. So earlier you had described the ectoplasm as potentially can be as strong as a steel rod, but I gather that at the same time it can be invisible. Yes, absolutely it can. Yes, absolutely it can. Yeah, yeah, it can. Uh, we don't understand fully how the spirit world work with it how they are able to, to transform it from something so unsubstantial to something very substantial. You know, we know that they create a rod, if you like, from the ectoplasm. One end is connected to myself and the other end will be connected to the small end of the trumpet. And that rod is able to then levitate the trumpet into the air and, fl and the trumpet will fly around the room, sometimes at tremendous speed. Sometimes two of them will be flying around the room at the same time, you know. And it's wonderful to observe, to, to witness this, to see it, you know. And sometimes the voices of the so-called dead will speak 
through the trumpet to, to the plums. One of the uh, spirits that's part of the team that works for you, uh, you refer to as Dr. Barnett. And I understand that uh, on occasion, Dr. Barnett will exhibit a full form materialization. Yes, that is quite correct. Quite correct. Um, it's very rare, I think, that any other spirit person actually materializes as such as solid as a solid human being, but he does, and very often when he does, it is in order to, to perform healing on somebody. Um, and can I give you an example of, of healing? Yes, please. Okay. Um, I would say that he is not always successful, but on many occasions he has been highly successful with healing. And the one healing that really uh, stands in my mind, I've never forgotten it, uh, was a gentleman who came along as a guest of the home circle. Um, and he came along. Um, my circle leader is always very careful as to who he would al allow to come to the home circle. But this gentleman came along. We really didn't know anything about him at all. And I, again, I would like, if I may, to read from my book, An Extraordinary Journey, because I give an account, or he gives an account here, of what actually was his experience. And this is what he had to say. Um, I was asked, this is uh, during the seance, I was asked to move my chair and position it in front of the cabinet. The cabinet, for anyone who doesn't know, uh, and I, I assume there'll be many people that don't, is just simply two curtains which are hung across the corner of the room, and I generally sit just outside of the cabinet. But if a materialization is to occur, the spirit well will move me back into the cabinet, the curtains will be closed, uh, and then they will, the spirit person materialized, will emerge from the cabinet. And incidentally, people know exactly where I am. I'm saying this for the skeptics because I have luminous tabs on my knees and the curtains remain open so people can see that I am exactly where I'm supposed to be in my chair. So this is what he says. Um, I was asked to move my chair and position it in front of the cabinet and then to turn my hands flat and extend them forward. I did so, and shortly after, Stuart's hands were placed into mine. So Dr. Barnett was not materialised as such, as a separate being from myself. He was actually within me. He was controlling me. Immediately, I experienced a strong sensation similar to an electric shock, which travelled up both my arms and into my chest. This lasted a few minutes after which I was asked to return to my place in the circle. Easier said than done. My legs were literally like jelly. However, as I resumed my previous place, Dr. Barnett announced that he had been able to change my organism, much to the amusement of the assembled crowd. He then stated that I would find out the result in three months, which at that time made absolutely no sense to me. The circle meeting continued, but for me it was all a bit of a blur. I simply cannot recall what else occurred because I could not stop thinking about what had just happened to me. At the time, I was suffering from a condition called cardiomyopathy, a heart condition suffered by victims of sudden adult death syndrome. My symptoms were severe. I would just collapse with no heartbeat, although thankfully my heart had, until that point, restarted naturally. In September 2011, I had a routine appointment with my heart specialist. The usual echogram and heart efficiency tests were carried out and I was asked back into his office directly when the tests were finished. He then asked, he then asked me outright, what have you done? Fearing that I was about to be admonished over my luck lack of dietary control, I answered that I enjoyed my food and I enjoyed my drink. He then again asked me 
but this time he explained that my condition had changed, my enlarged heart had reduced to within bounds of normality and my heart efficiency had improved from just 22% of my previous visits to a normal 60%. He added, he added that whatever I had done, he needed to know because he had a waiting room full of patients with a similar diagnosis and the heart never returns to normality. In that moment, I simply could not give him a reason. He then told me, as far as he was concerned, I no longer had the problem and he was happy to sign me off from any future treatments. Understandably, I excitedly shared that wonderful news with my wife and my family. But it was not until some time later, when in conversation with a colleague, that my wife suddenly asked what date it was when I had seen the specialist. It was September the 27th, exactly three months from the date of the settle. Dr. Barnett's prediction had most definitely come true. Well, you know, what can we say about that? Now, that is just one instance, and we've had many others. But that was not whilst Dr. Barnett was materialised, he was actually working through me. I understand that on occasion, when he does materialize, using the ectoplasm, he creates a voice box so you have independent voice. He's able, to, and other spirits as well, they can speak through the trumpet uh, independently of your vocal cords being used in any way. Yes, that's quite correct. Uh, usually, when Dr. Barnett speaks through the voice box, which is referred to as the direct voice, uh, it's probably about a foot away from my left shoulder. Uh, and often, I'm awake and I can hear for myself, and you know, and I take part in the conversation with, with Dr. Barnett. You, you take part in the conversation? Do you mean you speak to him? Yes, yes, sometimes, yes, I can, yes. That's quite uh, amazing. So it, it, there are moments when you're not really in uh, a deep trance at all, that you, you must be relatively wide awake. That's quite correct. But this has happened in more recent years. For many years, I never observed, experienced anything. I would just sit in the circle the circle would start, the music would begin to play, and then that was it until the circle was finished and I came back out of chance. And as I recall, uh, the music that you use has been the same music uh, for many, many years. It has been exactly the same music. For me, Jeff, I always think of it as a trigger, you know. That music is so vitally important for me. Just as I was saying a while ago that I have two lives. When I walk into the seance room, I become Stuart Alexander, the medium, you know, and it's like a trigger. I can't explain it to you, but it, it, this has happened over so many, many, many years that my mind, I, I presume, has been programmed, you know, when I walk in for the seance, then I become somebody else. And that music is an essential part of that transformation. Yes, it is. I don't know if I could go into trance if it was different music. I really don't. <laughs> uh, may I ask what uh, particular music you play? Oh, it's just gentle orchestral music. Nothing with words, you know. I, I, I don't think that would work for me because if I knew the words, I'd be singing along probably. So, so it's just gentle, soft music, orchestral music. Now, another thing of interest uh, with regard to the uh, story that you just read is that Dr. Barnett seemed to know in advance that it would be exactly three months for uh, this individual to receive the medical confirmation of the healing. It, it suggests that in the spirit world, time is quite different and they can see into the future in ways that we cannot. Well, I think that's quite correct. I mean, on many occasions they have said that time and space is nothing to them. You know, over there it, it just doesn't exist, you know, in the way that it does here. That's all I can really say. Yeah.
Another experience that I understand has occurred from time to time in your seances is that uh, of levitation. You will find yourself seated in your chair, but the chair is raised up so that you're near the ceiling. Well, that's very, very rarely happened, but it has happened, I think, probably on three, four, five occasions, you know. And generally speaking, it has been at public seances. You know, public seances. And it's the strangest thing. Uh, I have to admit, I don't like it. You know, it, it's very unnerving. It's not that I don't trust the spirit well, I trust them 100%. But nevertheless, it is unnerving to suddenly find yourself you know, above the heads of everybody in the in the seance room. Well, I imagine there's always the, the fear that you could suddenly fall. No, I wouldn't fear that at all. You know, I have 100%. I trust the spirit world more than I trust anyone on this earth. Seriously. So it would happen as if you're in trance and then you open your eyes and discover that you're up near the ceiling? Uh, no, uh, more often than not, I've not actually been in trance when that has happened. I think from memory, it's been towards the end of the seance that this occurs, you know. Um, and the last time it happened was the final public seance I gave at a, a wonderful church in the northeast of England called Craghead. Uh, there's a long story as to why I chose that church, but I won't go into that. And it was right at the end of this final seance, and my chair was moved out into the center of the circle, and suddenly it began to rise up into the air until, you know, I was very close to the ceiling. That was the last time I can remember that this happened. So you were wide awake the whole time? Yes, I was. on that. Yes, at the end of the seance when that occurred, yes which was a little unnerving. <laughs> and once again, I assume that the spirits somehow used ectoplasm to levitate the chair. Oh, absolutely. 100% correct. I mean, that would not have occurred without the presence of ectoplasm. And I would also say, Jeff, that, you know, I think people very often, and this includes spiritualists, assume that all the ectoplasm is extracted from the medium that's it. Well, I don't think that's true. I think, yes, the majority is taken from the medium, but also, uh, and we know this because we've been told it by the spirit well, that occasionally ectoplasm is also taken from some of the sitters. And they always say, whatever we take, don't worry, we shall return at the end of the sitting. <laughs> and sometimes people can feel, you know, a strange sensation. Yes. And I understand on some occasions also near the end of the seance, I think you find that your body is illuminated. You sort of are glowing. The most extraordinary thing this, because this is something that has started to occur over the last, I would think, 12 months, probably 12 months. Uh, and I can remember very clearly coming out of times, and this was in the home circle, of course. It's always occurred in the home circle, nowhere else. Uh, and uh, we were talking about, you know, they were, members of the circle were talking about what had happened, etc. And I just happened to glance down at my right arm, and I thought, man, God. And from the elbow down to the wrist, or down, down to the hand, was seemed to be illuminated. And I thought, am I seeing things? And I said to the lady sitting at my side, I said, J just look. I said, do you think my arm illuminated? And she looked, yes, it is. And then over a long period of time, many sittings, then it became that both arms became illuminated. Uh, and then uh, eventually it was, it was the top half of my body that was illuminated. And the most extraordinary thing. The most extraordinary thing. I've never even heard of this happening, you know, in all the years that I'd uh, studied the subject. I'd never heard of this, and I don't know the reason for it. I only know that it does happen, and it's illuminated. And it's most extraordinary. And again, this occurs while you're awake and conscious. Oh, yes, at the end of the, each seance, yes. It doesn't always happen, but it does happen quite a bit now. But the circle, as such... We sat for 40 years, near on 40 years now, uh, the same circle, but uh, we haven't sat now since March. 
and we're missing it terribly. And this is because of the pandemic, because of coronavirus, and we just dare not sit. We think it would be too risky. So we are missing it tremendously. We know the spirit world are missing it tremendously as well, you know. Uh, and it's so, so sad because it was such a major part of our lives. I gather that many times people will come and sit in the circle and nothing will happen at all. And uh, people still feel it's a worthwhile activity. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You see, because the point is, okay, from time to time, we have what we call blank sittings where seemingly nothing happens. Now, I've lost counts of the times over the years that developing circles have contacted me and said to me that they were dismayed, that sat for so long, that had blank circles and blank circles. And, back. and I say to them, look, the Sionsium is the laboratory of the spirit world. It is the laboratory of the spirit world. We may think in our ignorance that we've had a blank sitting, but we have no idea, no conception whatsoever as to what the spirit world have been busy doing, you know, creating, uh, putting in place the building blocks for the future. That's what they've been doing, you know. We might not be aware of that, see it, sense it, doesn't matter. That's what they've been doing. And so we put our trust, ultimate trust, in the spirit world and we'll leave it to them. Leave it to them. I'm under the impression that persistence is, is really crucial. I would say that it was quite a long period of time before White Feather first made himself known, control me and spoke those few words. But from then on, it's been a very, very slow process of developments. You know, and I always say these things cannot be rushed. That's obvious, you know. Um, so it has taken a long, long time, I have to say, you know. But that doesn't matter to me. It doesn't matter in the least. Because apart from anything else, we meet together as friends. We're all rowing in the same direction. We're all singing from the same hymn sheet. We all have the same hopes and aspirations, you know. And we gather together as friends and we sit there and... When we walk into the seance room, when we close the door, we leave the outside world outside, you know, and it's just wonderful to be together. And we know, even if the spirit world don't, are not able to communicate for whatever reason, we know that they're there, you know, and it's lovely. It's like a big family, two families coming together, becoming one family. Stuart Alexander, uh, what a wonderful time this has been to share your passion, your your love for this work that you do. Thank you so much for being with me. I'm thrilled to be able to share your experiences with our viewing audience. It's been a great privilege and pleasure for me, Jeff, and I just want to say thank you very much for inviting me, and I do hope that, you know, people, when they view this, will well, entertain, at least entertain the, the thought that there is indeed survival beyond death for all souls and that communication between the two worlds is indeed a possibility under the correct circumstances and conditions. Well, thank you, Jeff. And for those of you watching or listening, thank you for being with us.